So, let me host. Cool. What we're going to do now is make a start on some questions. And how we're going to run this morning is I'm going to show you a question on the screen. I'm going to give you two or three minutes to come up with your answers. And um, um, as you, as you, um, um, as you do that, you make a note of your answers, and then we'll go through them and discuss them in a in a moment. So I'm going to show you the first question, leave for two or three minutes, just to think about it, come up with your answers, and then we'll discuss the question and why it's important. So here we go. have a go at that so we should we should talk talk through that um um good so um lateral resolution exceeds axial resolution lateral resolution is better than axial resolution so we end up talking a little bit about this yesterday though the hand meant to so side to side resolution, lateral resolution is better than axial resolution. So you don't know. You sit in the exam, you say, my goodness, I don't know. I, you, by the way, in the background, you can see my friend, um, Alan Fitchett, who's a cardiologist in Manchester, who's come down to, to um, join us to, to help with today. So I'm very grateful, Alan. Um, um, okay. I'm going to kick off with it with the physics stuff. So lateral resolution exceeds axial resolution. So lateral resolution is better than axial resolution. You're not sure. You sit in the exam and you go, oh, I've no idea what he's talking about, really. I, I definitely don't answer the question. So resolution means how well you can see things, doesn't it? That's what it means. And um, <laughs> it's saying, do you see things better side to side? Or do you see things in more detail up and down a scan line? So if you don't know, you should think back to what you do in the in the echo lab every day. If you want to measure something, if you want to measure the size of something, then you you arrange that the thing goes across the screen so that you measure like the septum or whatever it is, and you measure it up and down the way, don't you? You so you set it so that the thing you want to measure is at right angles, horizontal on the screen, and you measure vertically in the screen. So that tells you the answer to this. That tells you that axial resolution up and down the screen is better than lateral resolution side to side in the screen because you choose to measure things up and down. So you don't even need to understand the question. You just need to think about what you normally do. And that is a really powerful thing for the exam. You know, go, even if you don't understand the question, try and relate the question back to what you do on a day to day basis because that'll give you the answer. But of course, that's not the real point of the question. The real point of this question is to tell you about lateral and axial resolution. We started to, to talk about that um, um, yesterday. And um, if you remember, what we said was that um, lateral resolution was the ability to tell things apart side to side, um, whether that's two dots or whether that's one big dot like that, and um, how, you, how you could tell the difference was whether the beam was narrow enough. So this beam reflected off that. The next beam was narrow enough to get down the space between these two dots, and the third beam reflected off that. Um, and if that was the case, then you see a bip from the, the first beam, silence from the second beam, and a bip from the third beam, so you'd know there's two things there. On the other hand, if your beam was much wider, the first beam would bounce off there, the second beam was too wide to fit in the gap, so it would bounce off as well, and the third beam would bounce off here. So if the beam was wider, you'd get bip, 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 and the machine would think there's something here, something here, something here, therefore there's something that's that wide there, and you couldn't tell those two things. So the thing that allowed you to see things side to side was beam width. So beam width determines Beam width determines lateral, uh, uh, 
yes, beam width determines lateral resolution. And the other thing we said yesterday was because the beam spreads out as you go further down the screen, the beam width is narrower at the top of the screen and wider at the bottom of the screen, so that lateral resolution is better at the top of the screen and less at the bottom of the screen, worse at the bottom of the screen. Okay. What about axial resolution? That is to say, are these two points two separate points or are they <clears throat> um, just one point? And um, how you can tell them apart is if your little bit of ultrasound, which looks a bit like that, we'll, come, we'll talk more about that later, what actually looks like this, this little wavelet like that. If it's length, the length of the wavelet rather than the wavelength, the length of the wavelet is short enough to fit in the space here, then you'll notice two bit, you notice two things here. Whereas if it's longer, then you won't notice two things here. So the length of the wave packet is the thing that determines whether you, determines the axial resolution. And that is because you've got a short wave packet. As it comes down here, it will bump into the first of these reflectors and it'll send back a signal. If it's small, it will then fit into the space between as it keeps going down, it will fit into the space between the two reflectors, not be touching any of them, so not reflect any signal. And as it comes further down, it will hit the second of these and it will reflect a signal back. So what you'll hear is you hear beep, silence, beep. Whereas if it's a longer wavelength, a longer wave packet, sorry, um, it will hit the first of these dots and it will start reflecting. But on the leading edge here, which is the second one, the trailing edge is still reflecting off the first one. So it doesn't fit into the space between the dots. So one of them is always reflecting. So you've got a long wave packet here. It would start reflecting on the leading edge hit here. It'd still be this tail end would still be reflecting on the leading edge hit here. So there'd be no silence in the middle because it'd be continuously reflecting. If you set a long wave packet down, you get a single burp back, and the machine would think there's something long there rather than two dots. So the, th the thing that determines um, the thing that therefore determines axial resolution is length of the wave packet. So coming back to the question, and remember, it's not about the question. It's definitely not about the question. Um, Oh, I just stop sharing. Is that the problem? Um, so coming back to the question, um, lateral resolution exceeds axial resolution. The answer is false. But you know that because axial resolution is better, but it's not about the question because that question won't arise in that format. It's about the things we discussed there. So, and that's a theme that goes through the through the day. Um, um, yes, there's a difference between wavelength and wave packet length. A wave packet is a little bundle of ultrasound you set down that might contain two, three, four, five wavelengths, or it might be very, in, in the case of CW, it's very long, isn't it? It's infinitely long. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about um, um, how you make a wave packet um, or a wavelet or whatever you want to call it. Um, 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 it's the, that being a bit of ultrasound that you send down the down the scan line. Attenuation of depth is corrected by TGC. Well, remember, we talked about attenuation yesterday. That's the fact that um, you're just walking through water makes you tired. It costs energy. A wave moving from one place to another costs energy just because of resistance and, and inertia and so on. And the only place that wave can get that energy is from the energy that it's carrying, because that's what a wave does. It moves energy from one place to another. So the wave moves it gets smaller, the amplitude gets smaller, doesn't it? And we said that means that for two reflecting surfaces to send back, if these are the two reflecting surfaces and here's the probe, to get to the first one, it's a short distance, to get to the second one, it's a long distance. So the second one's going to have moved a lot further, so have more um, 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 attenuation, so be a weaker signal, even though these two look the same. So therefore, we said, as you go deeper, you need more amplification or gain of, of this added to the signal to make them look the same. 
And one of the ways you correct that is by time gain compensation, those sliders that are on the echo machine. So that's correct, isn't it? Double image artifact is due to refraction. Um, um, so let me just share my screen again while I explain that one. The answer is yes, it is. Um, let's put the whiteboard back on. What's refraction? Refraction, remember, is bending, change in direction of the beam because of a change in medium, isn't it? And here's your probe, and here's the thing that you are taking a picture of, a strong reflector like a tin aortic valve. It's got a slightly shape like that. And normally what happens, the beam comes down, bounces back, and the machine picks up signal coming up that direction and says, therefore, I know there's something there. The next beam might hit the rough surface here and be bounced off in that direction. Because it's not a perfect reflector. And that beam should never come back to the back to the probe, should it? But if there happens to be something like a blood vessel or a cyst here, so the change in medium, it can be shaped so that as you come in, there's a bend, as you come in, come out there's another bend. Um, I've not drawn it quite right. But, you know, as you get a change in medium, you get a change in direction. That's refraction. It refracts again when it comes out. And by chance, it might head back to the to the, um, to the the probe along the scan line. So the, when the probe then looks down the scan line, sees any signal coming back, it sees a signal coming back. It doesn't know that this cyst or blood vessel or whatever is here and has bent the beam. So it presumes the beam has originated from down here. So you get a weak beam that looks like there's a second aortic valve over here. So that's true then, that um, um, that's the mechanism of how that um, refraction can cause a double image artifact. So that's true. Waves are generated and received by piezoelectric crystals. That's true. And we know that's true. And um, 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 we talked about that yesterday. That's exactly the way that you, you make waves. And then the last one is that um, signal aliasing occurs when blood velocity exceeds the Nyquist limit. And I'll bet you, you all said true, didn't you? And actually there's a problem here. Because what I've done, what I've done is I've taken lots of words that you know are related to aliasing and I've stitched them together and I've made them sound correct. And if you take this at face value, you'll say it's true because you sort of half read it and say, yeah, I know the aliasing occurs and the but when the velocity is too fast and the thing that determines that is the Nyquist limit. But what's the Nyquist limit? The Nyquist limit is half the pulse repetition frequency, isn't it? So how, and that's measured in cycles per second, it's measured in hertz. So how can two meters per second be more than four hertz. It can't be, can it? It doesn't make sense. How can you say, you know, two, two Ford Fiestas is more than three Vauxhall Corsas? You know, how can you say two bananas are more than three apples? You can't. You can't compare things that aren't the same. Um, um, so you can't say two meters per second is more than four hertz. So it's false for that reason. If this question said signal aliasing occurs when the blood velocity exceeds the aliasing velocity, for sure it's true. Signal aliasing occurs when the Doppler frequency exceeds the Nyquist limit, for sure it's true. But I've mixed those things up. So watch out. You know, questions can be written like this so that they, they look absolutely reasonable. Until you, until you, um, um, until you stop and think about it. So don't be caught out with things like this. Okay. So that's the end of the first question. That's false for the reasons we've said. So for the next question, I think you should be able to see a poll just appeared on your screen, so you can put your answers into the into the poll. 
um, if that's all right. Part A, B, I've called it part one, two, three, four, five, but you know, that's um, 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 just the, the parts A, B, C, D, E, there's five questions. So you should have five answers. So put the true and false into, into the poll. And, um, you know, it's helpful to see, I don't know how somebody's answered them already. Because hang on, you've not seen a question yet. You can't answer can't answer it yet. I'm going to end that and um relaunch it. Um so don't don't answer the questions until you've seen until you've seen them. Um okay, so hang on, I will show you the next question now and you can have a look at that, give a couple of minutes to do it. stop that there and go through the go through the um questions so hopefully you can see what you thought and um you know actually you can see that most of these are about 50 50. so lower frequency waves are better tissue penetration you look at this you think goodness me i've got no idea but actually even if you don't understand any of the science, you do. Because what you do is, what we said a moment ago, you go back to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're doing echo in an adult, what probe do you pick up? Two megahertz, three megahertz probe, don't you? If you're doing echo in a child, or you're doing transesophageal echo, something where the, the heart is near the probe, so you've got less, the beam has got less distance to travel, what frequency do you use then? You know, you use 8 or 10 megahertz. So you know the answer. You know the answer. When you want to see further away, you're using a 2 megahertz probe. And when you want to see closer together, you're using a 10 megahertz probe. When you see something closer, rather, you use a 10 megahertz probe. So that tells you, that tells you the answer without understanding anything about the, the question of the science. When you want to see things further away, you use lower frequency so lower frequency must have better tissue penetration so that must be correct and it is correct and it's correct for an obvious reason if you're going to allow one wavelength so so um 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 a low frequency has got a high wavelength hasn't it so if you if one wavelength is going to pass into the into the into the, the tissue before you start to see lots more attenuation if that wavelength is long it's going to go further than if the wavelength is short so because the wavelength is short, it doesn't go so far before it attenuates and disappears. So, so um, generally, low frequency, better tissue penetration, but because the wave is longer, your wave packet is going to be longer, and therefore you're going to have worse axial resolution, aren't you? So low frequency gives you less resolution, but better penetration. Higher frequency is the opposite. You've got a little short, wave packet so you get good axial resolution but less penetration so you can't see so deep into the body so you've got to balance those two things out and choose a frequency that that, that balances out the detail you can see the resolution with what you can see the penetration okay um so that one was true time gain control changes the transmission gain um um, so TGC, so this is the difference between pre-processing and post-processing. So pre-processing is something you do to the signal before you send it out from the probe. And post-processing is something you do to the signal when it comes back to the probe. And this is um, an example of something you do when it comes back to the probe in the machine. You change the amplification of the signal that you've received. So this is post-processing. So it's a reception control after you receive the beam back not when you send the beam out so that is false electronic beam focusing so you won't you um 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 may not know the answer to this but the reason for this question is so i can explain to you how a phase the rate probe works um i remember we said yesterday we would discuss that today in one of the questions well this is the question um so how does a phase the rate probe work so the phased array probe has got a whole set 
of lots of crystals along its head. And it makes a beam by each little crystal sending out a little wavelet like that. And then these wavelets move on, they cross over, they interfere, and you can see the line of maximum interference will be here, and they make a beam that goes forwards. So that's how you make a beam that goes forwards. How do you make a, so first of all, <coughs> how do you steer the beam to go left or go right? Well, what you do is you set these little um, um, crystals off at different times. So for example, if you want the beam to go to the left of the screen, you set the one on the right off first. So you set that off first. So this beam is a time to get to here. The second one you set off a moment later. So it's only got to here. The next one you set off a moment later, it's only got to here. The next one you set off a moment later, it's only got to here and so on. And you can see that the line of interference is now this line here, which is a beam going in that direction. So you steer the beam by changing the and transmission by changing the the um, the timing of activation of the crystals, and you steer the beam and reception that as you listen along this line by listening in the opposite order. So you listen at the left hand side first and the right hand side later. So you can steer the beam in both reception and transmission. How do you focus the beam? Remember, the focusing means making the beam narrow. So you focus the beam by um, setting off the outside ones first. So these two get to here. These ones get to here. These ones get to here. That one gets to there. And you make a curved beam like that, which is going in this sort of direction. And that makes a beam that does this. And that's how you focus the beam. And again, you can do the same in reception. Um, listen at the outside ends first and the middle last to hear a, a, the focus beam coming back. So therefore, um, your question about electronic beam um, focusing can be done for beam transmission and beam reception is true. And that's how it works. You alter the timing of activation of the crystals. Ultrasound pulse length determines axial resolution. Um, we've said that already in our discussion about resolution earlier on. The length of the pulse, the pulse length, the wavelet length, whatever you want to call it, determines how good the axial resolution is. That's true. And receive zoom improves the spatial resolution of the heart. This is another, another question about um, um, the difference between pre-processing and post-processing, things you do to the signal once you get it back, as opposed to, to the signal before you send it out. So after you've received it, so after you've got the signal back, if you increase the the um um increase the size so you zoom into a bit of it does that give you better resolution no it doesn't it's a different it's like the difference between optical zoom and and um digital zoom in your camera you know if you use digital zoom it gets bigger because you do digital zoom after the image is on your camera don't you you do you do a digital zoom and you make it bigger and bigger and bigger it just gets blocky if you want to get a high quality zoom image you do it you adjust the, the, the telephoto lens, don't you, before you take the image. And that's transmission zoom. And you zoom in and just this, use all the processing power of the camera and this tiny little thing. And then you get a high resolution image of what you're taking a picture of. So the difference between receive zoom and transmit zoom is the same as between optical zoom and digital zoom in your camera. So once you've received the signal back, you can't improve its resolution. You've already got it. So that's not correct. Okay, so next question. Let's bring that poll to a close um, and I don't know why it keeps it's jumping about the screen. Um, and I will go through these with you. So aliasing occurs with continuous wave Doppler. Most of you know that's false. And that was the whole point. We discussed that yesterday. The continuous wave Doppler, you can measure any speed. You don't get aliasing. Um, 
Aliasing can always be unwrapped by moving the baseline. Um, so if you remember aliasing is that thing in the, in the echo PW screen where the, the top of the E wave goes off the top of the screen, appears at the bottom and might wrap around several times. So the answer is you know that sometimes if you move the baseline, you undo the aliasing and you can see the whole of the E wave, but often you can't. So you know that's not true. It's also fair to say that there are few absolutes in medicine. Um, so the words always or never generally mean that if you if you don't know the answer, you're likely to be correct if you choose false rather than true. If you see an absolute in the in the in the um if you see an absolute in the answer. Aliasing can be removed by using high PRF where each echo train is followed by a listening period. So somebody was asking about high PRF yesterday, and I said there's a question about that today. And um, so the question is to help me, is to is to allow me just to dis describe high PRF. So what if you remember when you do Doppler, what you do is you take your probe and you send out, so pulse wave Doppler, a little wave packet like that, and it, it hits the thing that you're interested in that's moving, and then bounces back. And you send off the pulse. You then say, I know it's going to take one, two, three, four, five, six seconds to get back to the to the probe. So you send off the bit of ultrasound. You then twiddle your thumbs and do absolutely nothing for six seconds, then see the bit come back. And I said, the reason you get aliasing is that you, you therefore only see what this thing here is doing every six seconds. So you miss out on lots of information. Um, so how about if you don't do that, if you send off the first bit of ultrasound, and when the first bit of ultrasound sends, gets to the place you're interested in, you then send off a second bit of ultrasound from the probe. So you've got two wave trains in play. What's the effect of that? That means that you've got twice as many wave trains getting to the thing you're trying to measure the speed of, doesn't it? So that means you've doubled the pulse repetition frequency. You've doubled the pulse repetition frequency. If you double the pulse repetition frequency, you'll double the Nyquist limit and you'll um, double the Doppler frequency you can measure. So you'll be able to you get less aliasing. So that's good. What's the cut? What's the problem? The problem is that if you send off a bit from the probe, bit, and you send off a second bit, when it receives a signal back, that signal might have come from the first signal reflecting from the 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 um reflect you're interested in or might have come from the second signal would because if you think of how long it takes for this to get back it's that distance there isn't it halfway there would do the same distance for the second signal to have bounced off something there and come back. So you hear a bit come back and using high PRF. What you don't know is whether the bit came from the first of the wave trains hitting the thing you're interested in, or the second of the wave trains hitting something halfway there. So suddenly you don't know whether you're hearing something that's reflecting at the point what you're interested in or something halfway there. So that means when you look at your box and using high PRF, you get a second gate appearing. You're interested in this bit here, but the signal might have come from the top gate. So that's high PRF. The advantage is that you um, get less aliasing because you can measure higher Doppler frequencies. The disadvantage is you don't know exactly where the signals come from. So aliasing can be removed by using high pulse repetition frequency where each echo train is followed by a listening period. So this question should make you come out in hives because there's two bits to it. And for this to be true, the whole thing has to be true. So let me put the question back up, actually, so you can see it. Um, 
So AO is in, can be removed by using high PRF. That's correct. We just described that. And high PRF is where each echo train is followed by a listening period. That's also true because you said you set up the BIP and then you wait and listen. So both of those statements are true. Therefore, the whole thing is true. Aliasing can be reduced by altering the spatial resolution of the pulsed wave technique. And that is just describing high PRF in different words. Because we said, you know, when you've got high PRF, you don't know if the signal came from here or here. So you've lowered the spatial resolution because with, with pulsed wave, you know it comes from here. You now know if it doesn't come from here or here. And indeed, if you have three wavelets in place, it'll be here, here or here. As you keep increasing the high PRF, you move closer and closer to CW. Um, so that's true. That's just that another description of high PRF. And then the last one, when aliasing occurs, it always makes velocity curves uninterpretable. Well, that's false, because you know there are things you can do about aliasing. What things you do about aliasing? Um, so the first thing you do is move the baseline. And you move the baseline first, because that keeps the curves big. And um, 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 big things you can measure more accurately. If that is insufficient, then you can change the scale. And sometimes you, there's room to change the scale without, without um, having to move to high PRF. So you do those two things for, in, the, in that order before you can say that you can't get rid of the aliasing. aliasing. So that's false. OK. Good. We'll move on to the next question. I'll relaunch the. Bandwidth should be as narrow as possible. I bet you all thought, bloody hell. <laughs> um, um, okay, so what so the quite this, this is this is this question is because I want to tell you about bandwidth. But I bet most of you didn't have a clue, um, um, unless you're a musician or an IT expert. Um, and you probably thought, I don't know. So what would you do in the exam? What would you do in the exam? You can't go back to, you know, your experience in the, in the Echo Lab because you've never come across that. But if you think about the question, what the question says is, this is probably something that I can adjust because it's tell you asking you how you want to set it. And if it's a, if it's a if it what else can you adjust? I don't know volume or gain. So replace the word bandwidth with something else you can adjust. The volume should be as loud as possible. The gain should be as high as possible. These things you know would be false if that's what the question said, wouldn't you? So therefore, even though you don't know what it means, but just in the presumption it's something you can adjust, the chances are this question is false, isn't it? And that's the kind of thing you have to do in the exam and say, how am I going to how am I going to come up with what I think is the best answer for this? Because I, I forgot to say this. There's no negative marking in this exam. So it's really important you come up with your best answer for every single question. So that's how I'd go about answering that question if I had no idea what bandwidth was, and you'd be correct in your answer. What is bandwidth? Let me tell you, let me tell you about my um, trip to trip to work. I, my statement is, I drive to work at 80 miles an hour. That, of course, is not the case, because in fact, what I do is, I drive along through a little village at 30 miles an hour onto the A50, where I drive about 50 miles an hour, or the 515, about 50 miles an hour onto the A50, where I drive 80 miles an hour, looking out for the policeman, until I get to Stoke, where I slow down to about 50 miles an hour. And then in the road to the hospital, there are three speed cameras all in a row. So I drive very much at 30 miles an hour, then I get to the park. So my I drive at 80 miles an hour was a lie because quite a lot of my journeys at 30 miles an hour and quite a lot of my journeys at 50 miles an hour. So it's quite a big mixture of speeds there. That's my journey to work. So I told you a lie when I said I drove at 80 miles an hour. I drove out to the Alps a few weeks ago. And I drove to the Alps at 80 miles an hour. 
that is much closer to the truth because here's my trip to the Alps. I drove out the village and got onto the A515, then onto the A50. Once I was on the A50, I drove up 80 miles an hour all the way to the Channel Tunnel, where I stopped driving for a short period of time. And then um, I got to French auto routes, which of course are excellent. And I adjust 80 miles an hour all the way to Moutier. And then when I got to Moutier, the last 20 miles up the mountain, I drove a little bit slower. So to tell you that I drove at 80 miles an hour to the Alps is closer to the truth. There's a much smaller mixture of, of speeds there because so much of the journey was at 80 miles an hour, it drowns out the other slower speeds. What the earth has that got to do with echo, I hear you say? Well, if I want to make a, a wave packet, what I need to do is make something that's vibrating at um, um, two megahertz, say. So that's what I want to make. That's the wave, the little bit of ultrasound that I want to make. But if, I, if, if this was possible, then it'd be really odd because this would mean that suddenly, all of a sudden, I was vibrating two million times a, a second and all of a sudden I stopped that. And the same way, I can't suddenly be driving at 80 miles an hour you have to work up to it. You have to work up to vibrating 2 million times a second. So you need to speed up and slow down. So in fact, to get my little wavelet that I want, which is the bit in the middle, I have to make this kind of wavelet where just like my trip to work, I speed up and slow down. And this is a short trip to work with a big mixture of speeds. And this wave packet is a short wave packet with a big mixture of frequencies. Short wave packet means good axial resolution, doesn't it? What if I don't want to have a big mixture of frequencies? I want to have a more pure two megahertz signal. Well, the only way to do that is a bit like my trip to the Alps. I have to make this longer. So most of it is at two megahertz and then speeding up and slowing down, but at the end become less important. So this has got a small mix of frequencies, like my trip to the Alps, a small mix of speeds, but has got a long wave packet. So poor axial resolution. And bandwidth is the mixture of frequencies. That's what bandwidth is. So um, if you've got a big bandwidth, you get um, that's got an effect on the overall quality of the image. If you've got a small bandwidth, you get better quality image, but you get poor axial resolution. So what you play off is image quality, which is bandwidth, against axial resolution, which is wave packet length. So if you make the bandwidth as small as possible, you'd end up with very poor axial resolution. So that's what bandwidth is. And that's why the question A was false. Because you made the bandwidth as narrow as possible, you'd get very poor axial resolution. Reverberation artifacts are caused by the phenomenon of total internal reflection. Um, just a little think about that. Back to the whiteboard for a second. So if you had total internal reflection, so here's your probe. Here is your um, strong reflector. The beam comes down. Some reflection, some transmission. And then you're inside the object and you have total internal reflection. So all it does is bounce backwards and forwards, never comes out again. So what image will that give you? That will give you a strong signal here from the first one that's bounced back and then no more signal at all. 
what will that give you? That will give you acoustic shadowing. It would be black in the sea, won't it? So actually, total internal reflection won't, won't give you reverberation artifact. Total internal reflection will give you acoustic shadowing. What will give you reverberation artifact is partial internal reflection. So some reflection, some transmission. Some reflection, some transmission. Here, some reflection, some transmission. Again, it bounces back, some reflection, some transmission. Again, it'll happen here, again, a weaker signal, some reflection, some transmission. So what will, what will this series of, of echoes cause? Well, the first one will cause a line here like it did before. The second one will cause a weaker line here because it's travelled this distance and back, hasn't it? The third one has travelled a further distance, so the machine thinks it's coming from down here. The fourth one, which is going up and down, up and down, up and down, has travelled this distance. So down there. So that is reverberation artifact, isn't it? And that's caused not by um not by total internal reflection, but by partial internal reflection. Um okay, back to the question. So that's false because that should say partial internal reflection, not total internal reflection. The piezoelectric effect is responsible for allowing crystallized ultrasound to transmit and receiver. That's true. The beam with the artifact may be responsible for a point appearing as a straight line. That's true. And that's just that the thing about that we talked about about um, 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 lateral resolution. If the beam is too wide to get between the two points, then it looks like a straight line. We drew a diagram of that earlier. So that's true. And then the distance from the crystal to the first side lobe is 1.5 times the wavelength of ultrasound longer than the distance to the main lobe. Pah! Ah, so, you've got no idea. It's a very, the, the question reads like a question which has been made to be very complex and therefore, probably, if you've got no idea, a very complex question is, is most likely to be hiding something, so it's most likely to be false would be my view in this. Um, um, what is it actually, what point is it making? Well, the real point this wants to make is um, that any probe will have a main beam, but it also has little side beams. And in a mechanical probe, these are present but, but weak. But in a phased array probe, these side lobes happen um, for a specific reason we'll explain in a second and are called grating lobes and are more powerful. And they're important because if there's something over here, like an aortic tin valve that um, um, hits one of the grating lobes, one of the grating lobes hit it. The machine doesn't know there's a grating lobe. So when it gets the, gets the signal back, it thinks the signal's coming from in here. So it'll move that image to over here and you'll see a ghost-like image of the aortic valve in the middle of the ventricle or something. And that's what causes it. It's caused by the grating lobes causing ghost images um, of things that shouldn't be there. Um, and why do you get them? You get them just because of the interference from all the little wavelets that we talked about before. You know, as these all move forwards, and the next ones come out, you get this kind of arrangement. And you can see the main beams here all cross over and give you beams going forwards. But you get other bits of of um, um, interference, such as between here, 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 and this this interference that makes a weaker beam going sideways. So that's why you get you get it because you also get grating lobes because of interference, um, which creates little wave fronts which move in other directions, and they cause things to 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 appear that they shouldn't do. And um, this question. It was for me to tell you about side lobes and, and grating lobes and it's actually false and the question is false because it says 1.5 because you 
to get interference, you need to have the, the, the peak on top of the peak. Um, so it has to be not 1.5 times the wavelength, but it has to be a whole number, one, two, or three times the wavelength. So it's this one's false, it's too hard, and you won't get asked this question. It's, it's false because of the 1.5. Okay, next question. So, Luke, um, this question, don't need a whiteboard for it. The temporal resolution of duplex and standalone CW techniques are the same. That's absolutely false, isn't it? And um, because we said yesterday, duplex is when you've got a little box, you're taking a CW or PW image, and you've got a little box at the top with the moving grayscale image. You use most of the most of the temporal resolution to take the grayscale image, and you really ruin the, the temporal resolution of the of the um of the CW technique when you use um, um, that. So that's a, a, a bad a bad thing to do. Don't do it when you submit a case, um, as we talked about yesterday. So that's false. Variance displays regions of high turbulence. Well, variance, that's that green thing. Yep. What is that green color on the screen? What does that mean? So variance mathematically is the square of standard deviation. So standard deviation squared is variance. Standard deviation, you know, measures how different things are. So um, 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 this is correct. It measures high turbulence. Turbulence being um, having lots of different values for the same thing. So if you just need to sort out the difference between, in your mind between aliasing and turbulence. So if you if you watch a race, a running race, um, everybody's running at high speed in the same direction. So everybody's got more or less the same speed in the same direction. So they would aliase because they're moving at high speed, but their turbulence is about zero because um, 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 they're all moving in the same direction with the same speed. So it's very smooth. So they'd have no variance, but would aliase. If we were in a room together and I threw some 10 pound notes up in the air, which is a very unlikely thing to happen. Um, everybody would be reaching around, grabbing different directions and so on, but nobody would be running away from the nobody would be running away from the 10 pound note. So nobody would be moving fast, but everybody would be doing something different. So in those circumstances, you'd have no aliasing because nobody's moving fast, but you'd have a high variance because everybody's doing at a slightly different direction at a slightly different speed. And lastly, if we were in the same room together and I was standing in the middle of the room and I shouted, fire! Everybody would get up, everybody would run, and everybody would run away from me in different directions out the fire exit. So there you'd have a high variance at, because everybody's doing something different and you'd alias because everybody was doing it at a high speed. So you need to sort out in your mind the difference between aliasing and variance. But variance does exactly this. It identifies regions of high turbulence. Color Doppler pixels include peak velocity values. We said that yesterday, if you remember, color Doppler's a lie. It's an average statistical technique. It's not Doppler. It's not just Doppler. And um, so whenever you see the word color, you think average. So that's false. It encodes average velocity values. The wall filter used by blood pool Doppler techniques is a high pass filter. Well, if you remember, we said, Blood moves quickly, tissue moves slowly, so blood will have a high Doppler frequency, tissue will have a low Doppler frequency. So um, if, if it's blood, it's got a high Doppler frequency, therefore you want a high pass filter. So that's true. Decreasing the depth of a sector will increase the frame rate. So what determines the frame rate is how, many, it's, it's how long it takes to take each frame. And if you make that shorter, you get more frames per second. And if you make the depth of the sector less, it'll take less time to go up and down than if it was deeper. So it takes less time to go up and down each line. It'll take less time to get acquire each line. So it'll take less time to acquire the sector. So you get more sectors per second, so you improve the frame rate. So that's correct, isn't it? Okay. And that's the end, it's the good news, that's the end of the, the, the physics questions for this morning. 
Um, so pros. I'm Alan Fitchett. I'm a cardiologist from uh, working in Salford. I've known Grant since university and been helping him with his course since we started it several years ago. So these questions hopefully will be a bit more straightforward um, than some of the physics ones. So bicuspid aortic valves affect one thousandth of the population, one in one thousand of the population. So bicuspid aortic valve is the commonest congenital abnormality and actually affects one in 100 of the population. So that's false. Uh, typically produce a central valve closure line on M-mode imaging. So I think most of us will know that they typically produce an eccentric line. Are associated with aortic coarctation, true. And so it's always important to, to also image the ascending arch and initial descending aorta. They're also associated with aneurysms and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And predisposed to infective endocarditis. So any abnormalities of the valve will predispose to infective endocarditis because of increased turbulence across the valve. So that's true. Characteristically becomes stenotic over the age of 70. Um, bicuspid aortic valves, because they're abnormal from birth, typically produce um, aortic stenosis at an early age, so in the uh, more likely in the fifth and sixth decade, whereas over the age of 70, um, we're talking about degenerative aortic stenosis, so that's false. Okay, next question. M-mode, parasternal sort of view, you would typically would see a central valve closure line with a tricuspid aortic valve. But with the bicuspid valve, because usually there are many different variants, but usually you'll have two of the cusps will be fused. The uh, closure line becomes eccentric. So rather through, than through the center of the aorta, it's, um, it's to one side. Does that help explain it? Thank you very much. See guidance on, on values. And so uh, with severe mitral regurgitation, a jet width base or vena contractor of point, point 0.7 would be typical, point 0.7 and above. So point 0.6 is uh, a bit too small. That's more. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is common. Now, any left sided valvular lesion is generally going to cause a degree of pulmonary hypertension, particularly if it's severe. So that is true. Simpson's calculation is a reliable guide to LV function. Uh, so Simpson's calculation measures ejection fraction, and I'm sure Grant would have um, drummed this into you yesterday, that uh, the, a measure of ejection fraction is related to LV function, but not in every circumstance. And because, uh, particularly in the setting of severe mitral regurgitation, this is like a pressure release valve, and so you can see a hyperdynamic left ventricle um, when left ventricular function is normal and a normal ejection fraction could actually indicate um, reduced left ventricular function. So that is false. Posterior leaflet restriction is associated with inferior akinesis. So that's, um, so that's true. And that's, um, so restriction due to basically failure of movement of the inferior wall. So not uncommon with inferior myocardial infarctions. Uh, left ventricular hypertrophy results. Now, this is, um, this is an interesting one. And the, the, we, we put false here because essentially in regurgitant lesions, you typically will get um, dilatation of the ventricle. Although it's probably not an eye, it's not a perfect question because um, there's potentially you could also experience a degree of eccentric hypertrophy. So not the best question. So don't get too worried if you're confused about that one, as long as you understand the difference. Yes. Uh, pericardial effusions typically overlap the left atrium. So it's important to essentially just and I imagine those of you who are scanning all the time will know this anyway, the difference between uh, pericardial and pleural effusions on uh, echocardiography and uh, identifying the differences between the two. So pericardi pericardial effusions sort of rarely overlap the left atrium. Do not cause tamponade if less than two centimetres in diameter. So if, um, 
So essentially, it all depends on the speed of accumulation. So a chronic pericardial effusion could enlarge, to example, a very uh, to three centimeters or more, and not cause tamponade because the pericardium is is essentially becoming more compliant as as the effusion occurs. But should an effusion occur quickly, for example, during um, cardiac procedure such as an angiogram or pacemaker implant, then tamponade can occur at much lower volumes and certainly less than two centimeters. So it's all about rate of accumulation. So the answer to that one is false. And anterior to the descending aorta, unlike a pleural effusion, that's true. Right atrial inversion for more than one third of systole is a sensitive indication of tamponade. And that's true. And the important thing to remember here is, is the difference between sensitivity and specificity. So um, uh, if you have right atrial inversion for more than one third of systole, it doesn't mean that there is definitely tamponade. But if tamponade is present, right atrial inversion will be present. So it's um, if, if that that makes sense. Our recognized complication of myocardial infarction. Um, apart from a few things in life, most things are a recognized complication of myocardial infarction. And in this case, it's likely to be due to either um, pericarditis as a consequence of a full thickness myocardial infarction. And then you can hear of Dresler's. And then there are other causes as well. But those are the common causes. So that's true. And I suppose we're being a bit harsh here, but essentially right heart dilatation um, means right ventricular dilatation. OK, I imagine in um, in the exam, it'd be a bit more specific. But essentially, when someone says the right heart's dilated, essentially we mean right ventricular dilatation. So given the first one away, occurs in atrial septal defect. So the answer there is true. And that's uh, essentially if the atrial, de atrial septal defect is large enough, you'll have volume overload and that causes right heart enlargement. Um, is commonly associated with patent foramen ovale. So the answer to that is false. So a patent foramen ovale is, is essentially a, a failure of the ostea, of the of the ostium secundum to close in utero. And it occurs in between one in four and one in five individuals and often res re results in a very small atrial septal defect with very small flows. And so therefore is unlikely to be associated with a um, with um, right heart dilatation because the volume changes aren't sufficient. Complicates um, tricuspid stenosis. And this is just um, uh, encouraging you to to sort of look at the difference between stenosis and regurgitation. So stenosis typically causes hypertrophy of the chamber proximal to the stenosis and then dilatation. So stenosis will not affect the chamber distal to, um, to, to, the, to, the, to the valve and therefore it won't cause the right ventricle to enlarge. Some of you might say, well, yes, it causes, it can cause the right atrium to enlarge, but again, being a bit harsher, we kept saying right heart dilatation means right ventricular dilatation. It's most commonly secondary to left heart disease. So the answer there is true. And you'll see that just from remembering clinical cases and the scans that you do, that when you see right heart enlargement, it's usually in the setting of, of left heart um, failure, either due to say muscle disease or valvular disease. The right heart is thinner walled than the, the left heart um, and therefore sort of dilates um, much more readily. Is a feature of constricted pericarditis. So the answer to that is false. Um, constricted pericarditis causes compression of all four chambers of the heart and not right heart dilatation. Stroke. Not an uncommon uh, request for, uh, for echocardiography. Um, it's associated with mitral stenosis. So the answer there is true. Mitral stenosis causes dilatation of the left atrium um, 
and atrial fibrillation, and so therefore can result in embolic stroke. It's associated with atrial myxoma. Um, atrial myxoma most commonly occurs in the left atrium and uh, is can produce embolic stroke, either due to the, the tumour itself embolising or thrombus forming on the tumour and embolising. So the answer to that is true. Complicates tricuspid valve endocarditis. Now, this always causes um, a, a little bit of controversy. There will be someone who says that this is true, but essentially the answer is false. Because if there's, um, if you have tricuspid valve endocarditis and um, you have embolus from that valve, um, it will travel um, through the right ventricle out of the pulmonary artery into so out of the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary arteries and typically causes septic emboli in the lungs. And we're, we're just emphasizing here the difference between left heart disease and right heart disease and where the emboli go. Is associated with papillary fibroelastoma. And um, this is a, a bit of a controversial one. There's debate about this, but, but one of the things we look for in unexplained embolic stroke um, will be papillary fibroelastomas on the valves um, uh, because there is a potential association with um, with embolic stroke and it and if no other cause is found then anticoagulation would be considered it's common in patients with patent foramen ovale and so we do know so the answer to this is false and, uh, and it's important to read the whole question. So is common in patients with patent foramen ovale. As I explained earlier, um, one in four, one in five individuals have a patent foramen ovale, but will not have stroke. And so most people have patent, who have patent foramen ovale do not tend to have embolic stroke. However, if someone does have an embolic stroke, a patent foramen ovale as a potential cause of that should be sought. Hopefully that makes sense. Next question. The myocardium. Amyloid is the least common infiltrative disease. So that's false. It is the commonest one. Left ventricle and right ventricle dimensions are always normal. Um, as Grant pointed out, if you're not sure, generally always is always false and never is always is always false as well but, but essentially with infiltration of the myocardium you're going to um, get thickening of the myocardium reduced function and it will alter the dimensions so the answer to that is uh, false mitral inflow e to a pattern always shows a restrictive pattern so that's false as we know you essentially um, can go through a pseudo normalization phase where the E to A pattern will appear normal. And that's why we use other, other measures of, of um, diastolic dysfunction. Patches of speckling in the myocardium are often seen. So the answer to that is true. That's the classical appearance of amyloid on echocardiography. Uh, um, we also see it often in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well, which is another infiltrative disease. Pericardial fluid is often visible. And the answer to that is, if I can just get it to come up, is true. Uh, particularly amyloidosis is not uncommon to see a small pericardial effusion. An assessment of congenital heart disease. Okay, I think we'll all agree that that's false. In the presence of a ventricular septal defect, a low velocity jet suggests a low pressure gradient between the left ventricle and right ventricle and is referred to as restrictive BSD. Okay, as well as um, highlighting issues about ventricular septal defects, this question is to remind you to read the question carefully. So in the presence of a VSD, a low velocity jet suggests a low pressure gradient between the left ventricle and right ventricle. So that's true, but then we've put in the second part of the question and is referred to as a restricted VSD. So that's false. A restricted VSD would be a very small ventricular septal defect with a high velocity, high pressure gradient. So just reminding you, particularly with these long 
questions with two parts. Make sure both parts are true. Theory allows good visualization of the interatrial septum and is therefore very good for detecting the size, number and type of ASD. That's true. And it's often uh, the investigation we use when transthoracic study is not sufficient to rule out an atrial septal defect. A continuous murmur is heard in the presence of a patent ductus arteriosus. So the, the medics among you will all know that that's true. And those of you who do echocardiography but don't examine patients, hopefully you'll realise that when you do pick up um, a patent ductus arteriosus, you see flow in systole and diastole, and that's why you get a continuous murmur. A bubble study is never needed to confirm the presence of a PFO or ASD, and we know that's definitely false. So bubble study is a very useful way of looking for a PFO and ASD. are true. Fabry's disease can mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the answer to that is true. And indeed, whenever we see um, a patient for the first time and we suspect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we look for Fabry disease, an inherited glycogen storage disease. Myxomas are gelatinous and friable. I don't know if you've ever seen photographs of them, but they do look very gelatinous and friable. Hence, thrombus can form on them and they can also embolize very easily. On a, and also on, on echocardiography, you can see they look generally sort of very friable and wobbly. One of the presentations of a myxoma is systemic emboli. And so I think we've answered that in the previous questions. The answer is true. They often arise from the left atrium and can cause systemic emboli, in particular stroke. Amyloidosis often presents with a regional wall motion abnormality. So amyloidosis is an infiltrative condition of the um, myocardium and therefore is likely to produce global myocardial abnormalities rather than reach regional wall motion abnormalities. Sarcoidosis causes restrictive cardiomyopathy and the answer to that is true. Sarcoidosis is again an infiltrative um, condition and can therefore cause constrict. <clears throat> typically measures velocities of one to two orders of magnitude less than blood pool Doppler. Um, so um, you might not be aware of what one to two orders of magnitude means, but essentially it means um, by orders of magnitude, it's going to be um, you know, 10 to 100. And um, uh, so tissue Doppler measures the movement of tissue rather than um, blood and therefore um, tissue generally is moving a bit slower than blood and yes it's uh it's that's true excuse me so signal requires higher amplification than blood pool doppler so if tissue gives off a much higher um signal than blood pool doppler and therefore requires less amplification so the answer to that is false it can be used to measure radial strain in apical views and so uh, the answer to this is false. And again, it's about looking at the whole question. So it can be used to re measure radial strain, true, but not in apical views. Apical views can look at longitudinal strain. E prime follows the same progression as blood pool E wave as diastolic function progresses. So we know that's false. And is a load dependent measure. And the answer to that is true. It's less affected by load than um, blood pool um, Doppler, but it will still be affected by load. Stress echo. Oh, let me give you a poll before I carry on. There we go. Is an unsafe procedure and needs to be carried out with care. Um, it certainly needs to be carried out with care, but I think we'd all agree that it's not an unsafe procedure. False. Can be used to assess the left ventricle outflow tract velocities during exercise in the presence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. True. It can be very useful assessing dynamic um, gradients in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
is useful if the resting ECG pattern prevents interpretation of ST changes during exercise. And so essentially when we used to do a lot of exercise treadmill testing, um, for example, left bundle branch block, you can't really interpret well and other ECG patterns can't interpret well on exercise and therefore um, stress echo much more useful as it doesn't rely on ECG changes. That's true. Good at assessment of myocardial viability. True. It's one of its fortes. Cannot be followed following, sorry, cannot be done following acute MI. So this is talking about in the acute situation of a, of a myocardial infarction. So cannot, you could actually substitute for, should never be done following acute MI. So the answer there is false, as we can do stress echo um, soon after myocardial infarction often on sort of day three, um, but we tend to use lower stress, just like we might use, uh, if we were going to do a treadmill test, we might use a modified Bruce protocol. Okay, so it is possible to do it, but it needs to be done with extra care. And therefore you have a bit more time for these questions that require a bit more in the way of calculation. So um, this one is all about aortic stenosis. Um, and so I think the first thing to do is you can see that there's a, a mention of the valve pressure drop and also a mention of the valve area. So a good idea would be the first thing to do is just do the calculations and then answer the questions. So I'm just going to try and um, okay, change my screen here. There we go. So hopefully you can see the whiteboard and the two the two sort of calculations um, we're going to use here um, will be um, indeed I've put them the wrong way around. So the first one is to assess the pressure, which is the bottom one on the screen here, which is the um, Bernoulli's um, equation. And because the um, the velocities are low, we should see the whiteboard, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, you can't see the whiteboard. Right. Let me just see if I can make the whiteboard. Yeah. OK, can you see it now? Yes, excellent. OK. Um, apologies for that. So the, the two equations we're going to use will be the continuity equation to work out the, um, the valve area and the and Bernoulli's equation. And because the, the velocities are low, um, we can't use the modified Bernoulli's equation. We use, need to use the, the full Bernoulli's equation. OK, so, so first of all, working out the, the cross-sectional area. And I get used to using this little whiteboard here. So what we're going to we're going to look at is the first of all, calculate the cross-sectional area of the LVOT. And you can do that. And, and so essentially that's going to be pi r squared. Um, another way of doing it is to use the diameter um, rather than the the radius, and that would be pi diameter squared over over four. Okay, so you just divide it divide it down. But so um, so it's going to be three point one four times, and again uh, three point one four times um, 0 0.19, because we're going to measure it in centimeters squared um, divided by four um, and then multiplied by the velocity in the LVOT. So LVOT peak velocity is 1.3 and then divide it by the velocity of the aortic valve and peak velocity is, um, is 2.6. And um, and the, the measurement you should get there is I'm pretty sure it should be 1.4 square centimeters. Okay. Uh, then when we want to measure the um, the peak aortic valve pressure drop, we're going to use the modified, uh, not the modified, the sort of full Bernoulli's equation, which is um, essentially the aortic valve velocity squared minus the LVOT velocity 
um, squared multiplied by four. And um, okay, so let's just work that out. So it's going to be 2.6 squared minus 1.3 squared times four. I'll just get my calculator out. Has anyone done that? These always take a, a bit longer. So here we go. So 2.6 squared minus 1.3 squared times 4 equals. So that should give us a peak um, pressure drop of about 20 millimetres of mercury. And I think what we're trying to do is just reiterate the importance that with low velocities, you need to use the full Bernoulli's equation, not the, um, not the modified one. And indeed, if you're, if you're given both velocities, um, use both velocities. Now, let me see, let's move back to stopping sharing that. So back to the question. So, so essentially, the, the, the valve area is um, 1.41 square centimetres. OK, so that counts as moderate aortic stenosis, not mild aortic stenosis. The peak aortic valve pressure drop is estimated at 27. So we calculated it as 20. So hopefully this will come out as false as well. Aortic valve area is estimated at 1.4 square centimetres. That was true. Um, OK, so standard protocol dibutamine stress echo would be appropriate and clinically helpful in this patient. And the answer there is false because this patient has aortic stenosis and we would tend to use um, low dose dibutamine stress in order to further evaluate the patient if we needed to. And then final question, if the patient had severe aortic stenosis, then stress echo would be expected to show an increase in transvalvular velocity. That's true. And a drop in valve area. So just be wary of these two part questions. It would not cause a drop in valve area. The valve area would be calculated as the same as, as, as all the velocities would, would, would alter. We're not going to change the valve area by doing um, a different investigation. So that's false. Okay, next question. Another calculation one. So I'll give you have a have a cuppa. This will be the last question we do before um before you have a break. So um few calculations to do here. The following data were generated during an echo study in a young patient. So lots and lots of numbers. Uh, first question: left ventricular stroke volume is is sixty seven mils. Next one: right ventricular stroke volume, aortic valve area, and then we're looking at a shunt. Um, shunt ratio. So let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, so should all be able to see that. And um, okay, so when we're assessing stroke volume, one of the simpler equations, essentially it's cross-sectional area, um, usually of the outflow tract, multiplied by the velocity time integral, which will give us the, um, the flow across ac across that, that area. So in this situation, we have the, um, the diameter of the left ventricle outflow tract is 23 millimeters. And so we could half that if we wanted to make to get the radius, but it's easier just to use the diameter squared over four. So 0.23 squared over four multiplied by pi and then multiplied by the velocity time integral um, through um, the LVOT. And the answer to that is 67 mils. But that's the that's the measurement we need to use. Now I'm just going to come back to the question. Okay. There we go. So left ventricular straight volume is 67 mils. The answer is 
true. <laughs> and then we have the right ventricular stroke volume is 88 mils. Now that's false. The 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 calculation um, gives you using the same calculation, but RBOT figures, of course, gives you 129 mils. The aortic valve area is best estimated at 2.9. And take my word for it, that's true. And then again, that's using the, um, uh, the Bernoulli equation. Now here, because we have the VTI, then essentially we should use um, we should use the VTI, okay, to get to get that figure rather than the velocity. If you're given the VTI, use the VTI rather than the velocity. Um, a useful quality uh, control check is LV stroke volume equals right ventricular stroke volume. Now, and unbeknown to me, I have to ask Grant. I still can't get my head around this, but although left ventricular stroke volume and right ventricular stroke volume can vary independently. Um, so Grant, can you answer this? Why is it false that this isn't a useful quality control check, that LV stroke volume equals RV stroke volume? Because you don't know the patient's got a normal heart. Okay. All right. There's your answer. And then we look at the shunt, which is uh, flow across the pulmonary valve divided by flow across um, uh, 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 through the pulmonary circulation divided by flow through the systolic circulation. And that essentially would be the right ventricular stroke volume, which was 129, uh, divided by the left ventricular stroke volume, which is 67. And that gives you a ratio of 1.9. So that's true. <laughs> so you could, you could only say that it's a useful quality control check that the left ventricular and right ventricular stroke volume were the same if you knew that the heart was normal. And this question suggests the heart is not normal, doesn't it? Um, 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 rather than being a problem with the calculations, that'd be an obvious conclusion. Right, there you go. All right, so we're going to stop now. So we've got 15 minutes to go and have a, a cup of coffee.